Okay, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Eleanor Painter, postdoctoral associate in Italian studies and the Kogut Institute for the Humanities. I'm leaning forward a little bit, so I hope you can hear me. Um, and on behalf of the Department of Italian Studies and together with my co-host for tonight's event, Sara Golantuono, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this reading and conversation with two celebrated writers, Uba Cristina Alifara and Amara Lacus. And we've called this event, as you see up here, Rewriting Borders, Narrating Italy Across Memory and Language. And it's such an honor to have, where are you, to have you both here. So thanks to you also for what you're about to share. Um, I want to give a special welcome to our on-campus and also our online audience. So um, thanks to those of you who are joining by Zoom. And please note that this event is being recorded. Um, in just a moment, I'll get things started by introducing our guests and situating the conversation. First, um, a few words of thanks and notes about other events that we have going on. Tonight's event is one of several taking place this week as we host Uba Cristina Alifara in residency here at Brown as a short-term visiting professor in the humanities with thanks to the Dean of Faculty for supporting this initiative and also to Suzanne Stewart Steinberg and Massimo Riva. Many people have made this residency and tonight's event possible. And that includes the Kogut Institute and their team, super thanks to Ben, Rachel, and Damien, to media services staff here, thank you, and to our own Bailey Killian. Thanks also to the graduate students in Italian studies who have helped plan and promote all of this week's events and for your participation. If you've heard about any of this on social media, thanks go to Elettra Solignani and Irene Fiducia. Speaking of other events, in the coming days, as you see up here, you can hear from and speak with Uba over coffee tomorrow morning. You can join us um, for a creative writing workshop with her tomorrow afternoon at the Chiasmi Conference, envisioned and hosted by graduate students here this Friday and Saturday around the theme of the contested body in Italian studies. And Uba is speaking Saturday morning at 10.30 there. And then finally, at a reading at Riff Raff Bookstore here in Providence at 6 p.m. And at that Sunday reading, we'll also have copies of the new English translation of The Commander of the River for sale. So if you've been itching to get a copy, you can come by there. Um, and of course, bringing Uba here, um, here to Brown also struck us as a chance to host a whole series of conversations, including this one with Amara Lacus, in which we get to hear from two great writers who have also known each other for a number of years, and who um, I just realized tonight have finally met in person after a long time of not seeing, of seeing each other only on Zoom, as has been true for so many of us. So this is a nice reunion occasion too. Um, all right, so <clears throat> we're here tonight to reflect on the role of literature, translation, and language itself in the construction and dismantling of borders and a myriad of connections, especially but not only in the context of contemporary Italy. And we're so fortunate to be joined by two writers whose work centers language in several ways. Their work has been translated into a number of languages and celebrated, read, and taught well beyond the Italian peninsula. Their writing plays with and interrogates language itself as a site of culture influx, a site for the preservation and challenging of memory, a site of encounter across multiple kinds of borders. And here we might think not only of geopolitical borders, but also racial borders, generational borders, the borders of genre, just to name a few. Both of our writer guests tonight take up themes of otherness and belonging in a changing Italy. And as their novels and short stories themselves also travel within and outside of Italy, they help create a language for the very specific histories of racial and religious diversity in Italy and for the ways those realities reflect or resonate with global questions of racial justice, the long durée of colonialism, and diasporic experiences that are, <clears throat> in many senses, translocal, rooted to specific cities and neighborhoods that connect lives across vast distances. My own first encounters with the work of these writers made me reflect differently on my own relationship with these spaces and histories. I know this is true for many other people. And more broadly, it made me think in different ways about the politics of language and the relationship between language and identity. So here with Uba and Amara, we have the real treat of hearing more about all of this um, from two writers whose work crosses multiple genres and styles, including novels, short stories, poetry, detective and mystery fiction, coming of age stories, uses of humor, and invocations of the longer and violent histories that shape the present. 
Uba Cristina Alifara is a Somali Italian poet, novelist, playwright, librettist, and oral performer. She's written numerous short stories and three novels, and tonight you'll hear from Il Comandante del Fiume, The Commander of the River, uh, which was recently translated into English by Hope Campbell Gustafson and published by Indiana University Press. And you'll also hear from Madre Piccola, Little Mother. And just to highlight a few more things, her recent rewriting of Antigone was staged in Palermo in ways that make direct reference to contemporary Mediterranean migration. Ali Farah holds a PhD in African studies. She's the recipient of the Lingua Madre and Vittorini prizes, and she's held numerous fellowships and residencies, including in the US at the University of Iowa. Um, and she's also served as a UN development program consultant for a project on oral historiography for peace building in Somalia. Amara Lacous was born in Algeria and moved to Italy at age 25, I think. Um, he has a degree in philosophy from the University of Algiers and another in humanities from the University of Roma Sapienza. He's the author of five award-winning novels, three of which he wrote in both Arabic and Italian. And tonight you'll hear him read in both these languages from the much acclaimed Scontro di civiltà per un ascensore a Piazza Vittorio, Clash of Civilizations over an elevator in Piazza Vittorio, which was translated into English by Ian Goldstein and published with Europa Editions. His latest novel in Arabic, Tira Lil, the Nightbird was long listed for the 2021 International Prize for Arabic Fiction. His novels have been translated into English, German, French, Spanish, Dutch, Japanese, Danish, and Persian, at least. Lagus is professor in the practice in the Department of Italian Studies at Yale University. And moderating the conversation on stage is my colleague, Sara Colantuono, a teacher and scholar who works at the intersection of Italian studies, gender and sexuality studies, and translation studies in the Italian Studies Department at Brown University here. She studies literature, visual art, and culture with a focus on the transnational and intergenerational histories of post-war Italian feminism. In this, she looks at how the dynamics of memory transmission operate and how they shape and are shaped by the politics of knowledge production, both within Italy's post-war history and across its geographical borders. As a translator, she works to open up texts that are testimonies of these feminist histories to other times and spaces. Her new translation of Leopoldina Fortunati's 1981 book, L'Arcano della Riproduzione, The Arcana of Reproduction, uh, and Carla Lunzi's writings are forthcoming with Verso Books and the Canadian journal Philip. So <clears throat> in deciding how tonight's event would go, the four of us talked a lot about language and voice. So the relationship between a writer's voice and the language in which they first write and how to make a version of that present for you here. And so we're gonna do something a little bit different with the idea that we're all gonna be listening and reflecting together about language itself um, and about these stories that they're sharing with us tonight. So we will, you will hear both readers give a very short reading um, in the original language and we'll project English translations here and on the Zoom. And then they'll be in conversation with Sara here on stage. Um, then we'll have a short second reading, and then we'll move to Q&A with you all. And for those of you in this room, stay um, and hang out for what should be a pretty nice reception afterwards. Um, and so I will hand it over first to Uba, first to Amara. Um, at, and we will hear first from Amara from um, Scontro di Civiltà. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you all for coming. This is my first time at Brown, and I'm very delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And as Eleanor, Eleanor mentioned, this is a fantastic surprise for, for me to meet uh, Christina. Um, I called her Christina, <laughs> not Uba, but this is, you know, when you... Um, when you met someone in the, you know, in the, um, and this is the, with, with, the, with the name, it sticks. So, um, so I'm reading uh, passages from my uh, novel, Clash of Civilization, over in Libertin in Piazza Vittorio. Just a little background about the, the novel, it's about murder. And the, the, the story takes place in Piazza Vittorio, is the, uh, interesting neighborhood. 
in Rome close to uh, Stazione Termini. Um, um, so there is a murder in the, in the building, and there are 11 characters. Each one gives um, his you know, version or his truth. So the no I wrote this novel first in Arabic. Um, and the novel was published in 2004. And after publishing this novel in Arabic, I, I said to myself, I have to give my Italian characters their original voices. Because when I, I was writing in Arabic, I can hear them, I could hear them talking in Italian. So, so then after, um, you know, the, in 2000, uh, 2004, I started writing on an Italian version. Uh, it wasn't translation, or at least if translation is, you know, uh, based on the f very, uh, uh, very famous, uh, you know, uh, Italian um, uh, definition of translation, translation, traduttore, traditore, translator, traitor. So I, I applied this this principle because it's the same story same character, but there are a lot of differences. Um, so I'm going to read, the, so there's 11 characters. The first character is uh, an Iranian, Parviz, uh, Mansour Samadi. So I'm going to read the first, just the first paragraph in Arabic, and then I switch in Italian. هل أميدي إيطالي أم لا؟ لا فائدة ترجى من هذا السؤال النفي أو الإيجاب لن يحل المشكلة ثم من أدراك من هو الإيطالي؟ من ولد في إيطاليا؟ أو من يملك جواز سفر وبطاقة تعريف إيطالية؟ أو من يتقن اللغة الإيطالية؟ أو من يحمل اسما إيطاليا؟ أو من يسكن في إيطاليا؟ المسألة كما ترون معقدة جدا لم أقل أن أميدي لغز يحير العقول إنه كرباعيات الشاعر الكبير عمر الخيام تحتاج إلى سنوات طويلة لإدراك مغزاها عندئذ ينفتح قلبك على العالم وتفيض دموعك لتدفئ خديك الباردين الآن على الأقل يكفي أن تعرف وناميدي يتقن الإيطالية أحسن من ملايين الإيطاليين الذين ينتشرون كالجراد في ربوع المعمورة Non sono ubriaco, non volevo offendervi, non disprezzo la cavalletta, anzi la rispetto per chi si procura il cibo con dignità, senza contare su nessuno. Poi, mica è colpa mia se gli italiani amano viaggiare ed emigrare. Ancora oggi mi meraviglio ogni volta che ascolto i discorsi di alcuni politici italiani nei notiziari e nelle trasmissioni televisive. Prendiamo l'esempio di Roberto Bossosso. Non sapete chi è Roberto Bossosso? È il leader del partito Forza Nord, che considera nemici gli immigrati musulmani. Ogni volta che sento la sua voce, mi assale il dubbio. Perplesso, mi guardo in giro e chiedo al primo che incontro. Ma la lingua che parla Bossosso è davvero italiano? Finora non ho ricevuto risposte convincenti. Spesso mi dicono tu non sai l'italiano, oppure prima devi perfezionare la lingua, oppure spiacente, il tuo italiano è molto scarso. Di solito sento queste frasi velenose quando cerco lavoro nei ristoranti come cuoco e alla fine mi sbattono in cucina a lavare i piatti. Sembra che l'unica cosa che, fa, che sai fare, caro Parvi, sia lavare i piatti. A Stefania piace provocarmi, prendermi in giro così. Non c'è dubbio che sia rimasta delusa da me, visto che è stata la prima a insegnarmi l'italiano, o per essere più precisi, ha tentato di insegnarmelo. Io non sono Amedeo, questo è chiaro come la stella nel cielo sereno di Shiraz, però mi dispiace dirvi che non sono l'unico che non conosce l'italiano in questo paese. Ho lavorato nei ristoranti di Roma con molti giovani, napoletani, calabresi, sardi, siciliani, e ho scoperto che il nostro livello linguistico è quasi lo stesso. 
Mario, il cuoco, il cuoco del ristorante della stazione di Termini, non aveva torto quando diceva «Ricordati Parvis, siamo tutti stranieri in questa città». Good evening. Thank you, Amara. I'm, I'm a little bit emotional now because, uh, yeah, um, we lived with Amara in Rome for many years together. And uh, thanks to Suzanne, to, to Eleanor, to... And I have been here in Brown 20 years ago, and now I'm back after so many years. Um, so I'm reading... I'm, I'll be reading an excerpt from um, my second novel, The Com uh, Commander of the River, which is a, a coming of age somehow novel. And um, the, the voice, I mean the, the character, the main character is a 18 years old boy who was raised in Somalia, uh, was raised in Rome, but uh, he has Somali origins. And um, in this part, he, is, um, he thinks that he doesn't remember the, the language. I mean, he doesn't speak Somali anymore because he lived in Rome, and even though his mother speaks to, to him in Somali, he knows the story, um, he doesn't think that he's able to, to speak. And um, in, this, in this very excerpt, he meets this group of um, um, people that, um, young, a, a group of young men, that uh, young uh, men that uh, um, are based in Rome but, but have different origins. and. Uh, and he, he meets this, man, this, this young guy like him, that is called Liban, that hasn't spoken to his mother for 20 years uh, because he arrived in Rome. He's a little older than him, but he arrived in Rome when he was 10 during the war, and then um, he, he lost contact with his mother. And then, so now he, he found the number of the mother and he has the opportunity to talk to her. And uh, he asked Yaber, the, the, the young protagonist, to help him translating this conversation with the mother. So yeah, so I will, I will, I will read this short excerpt from Il Comandante. Il call center era un negozietto angusto con dentro tante cabine a vetri. C'erano scritte in varie lingue e oltre alle pareti trasparenti si vedevano le persone parlare. Ognuno muoveva la bocca in modo diverso ma non si sentivano le voci, sembravano tanti pesci dentro un acquario. Appena entrati, il gestore, un uomo con la barba bianca, ci ha chiesto «Dove volete chiamare?» e noi gli abbiamo spiegato la situazione per farci dare un telefono doppio, dato che io e Liven dovevamo sia parlare che sentire. Dopo qualche minuto ci fa entrare in una cabina con due cornette. Lo spazio è risicato e fa un caldo infernale. Siamo sudati, l'aria è bollente, il numero telefonico è infinito, il prefisso è infinito e il tempo che ci mettono a rispondere è infinito. Mi sembra di stare in una grotta umida e penso che anche il telefono dall'altra parte sia un posto del genere, una caverna bollente, come la nostra, con dentro la madre di Liben che aspetta da vent'anni. Il telefono squilla, attendo la voce, e Liben mi fissa perché ha paura del mio silenzio. Mi dice... Coraggio! E dall'altra parte sento, hello, yawai, pronto, chi è? Parlano in somalo e capisco tutto, ma finora ho solo trasformato il somalo in italiano. Non so trasformare l'italiano in somalo io. Dall'altro capo del telefono dicono, hello, e il Liven mi ripete, coraggio. E io vedo le parole in fila dentro la testa, le sento e le vedo tutte, scalciano e prendono forma come noci e io spingo con la fronte e con gli occhi per farle passare. Le parole sono dure, mi tagliano la testa, come quando fa caldo e bevi qualcosa di gelido. Sento una fitta tra gli occhi e riprendo fiato. Ma anche così il dolore non smette, allora ricomincio a spingere con forza, ed ecco che san sento le parole venirmi alla gola e tocco la loro forma con la lingua. Spingo l'aria fuori e le parole fuoriescono intere dalla mia bocca. Vedo lì Ben sorridermi e dire «Mamma, sono io», lo dice balbettando e io ripeto balbettando le sue stesse parole «Hoi, Waniga» e le parole «Mamma, sono io» 
suonano uguali nella nuova lingua, forse un po' più secche. Gli venne frenetico e volle parlare di troppe cose, di quanto l'ha cercata, di quanto gli è mancata, di quanto l'ha pensata, ma riesce a dire solo parole semplici e la madre ripete le stesse cose e io sono la madre e il figlio allo stesso tempo. Siamo nella grotta e l'aria è bollente. Io e Liben siamo tutti sudati e tediamo ciascuno una cornetta legata a un filo. La voce della madre arriva a tutti e due e le nostre voci le arrivano insieme. Sento le parole tutte intere nella bocca. Era tanto tempo che non le sentivo e quelle parole sono le parole del figlio e sono anche le mie. Io e Liben diciamo insieme Hoyo, mamma e Waniga sono io. Hello. Um, so we will do a little bit of conversation. Thank you so much for reading. It was very, very, um, I don't know, I'm a little bit emotional. It was beautiful. It was really nice. Um, can you hear me well? Is it? Okay, good. So I think um, the first question I want to ask you both and Um, it's what does translating mean for you? Amara, you mentioned the fact that it's, um, it's, you know, it can be an act of betrayal, betrayal, traduttore, traditore, and, um, but, um, it could also be an act of giving birth to something else, that it's, you know, it's a new thing, but but still the same. Um, it can be a generative act and but and ha and so it's a it's a double question. What does translation mean for you and how does inhabiting more than one language um, shape your your writing? You both are inhabiting more than one language. One, two, three. <laughs> and in your life and in your writing. So how, how does that, how does living and talking and speaking and dreaming in more than one language shape your writing? Thank you, Thank you for the, this question. Um, maybe a little bit of uh, background. I. I was born in, 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 in Algeria into um, a Berber or Tamazigh, I say the, the indigenous language of North Africa. Um, so I, so the first language that I learned is my mother tongue is Tamazigh, uh, Kabil. Um, and um, at age four, I went to a Quranic school. I learned uh, classical Arabic. I mean, I memorized some verses of the of Quran um, and in uh, in the street I I learned Arabic Algerian it's a mixture of some French uh, Arabic and at uh, I think in, in the third, third grade in uh, at school um, um, elementary school probably at age eight we uh, six seven seven eight we start uh, I started learning French So uh, there are many languages at the same at the same time. So when I started writing, I felt this lack of uh, you know living or writing just in one language. Uh, by the way, writing in Arabic actually is translating. The reason because there there is a, a distance between uh, spoken language and written language. This is why. <laughs> I used to say that Arab writers are translators, basically, uh, because they are not using this language, the spoken language. And this is a different experience for me writing in Italian. When I'm writing in Italian, um, I'm using the spoken language, uh, basically. Of course, I can change some, you know, I'd be very careful for the verbs, but, is, but in Arabic, it's completely different. You have to translate. Uh, so translation is, is uh, you know, it's just in its origin. Um, now, uh, languages, uh, language is, uh, is, uh, 
is central in, in literature. There's no literature without language, without style. Um, because basically, writers write uh, um, the same stories, but in different way, in different ways, in different ways based on languages. And languages are, are different. Uh, it's very different, you know. Um, this is why I used to say that um, languages are like individuals. Um, sometimes they are fragile, sometimes they are strong. Uh, and uh, the, my advantage as bilingual writer, hopefully I, 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 my American dream, by the way, is to add English to, to my creative, to my writing, uh, my writing. So and maybe in the future. Uh, uh, so is that um, give to give the, the, the my p I can give my characters the possibility to choose which language they want. Uh, and it's not just it's not uh, <laughs> a happy story. Uh, let me explain. My last novel uh, that I wrote in Arabic. Um, in 1990, in uh, 2019, I wrote Italian version, but uh, I, it wasn't good. The reason because my characters, Algerian characters, refused to talk to me in, uh, in, in Italian. So this is why I asked my first translator, Francesco Leggio, to translate it from Arabic into Italian. So that now my, uh, the compromise that I have my, with my characters is that you choose which language you want. You want in Arabic, you want in Italian, maybe in English. So um, this is about translation. Thank you so much for this. So um, for me, um, it's a different, um, I mean, what you are saying resonates a lot with me. Um, I, I was born in, uh, in Italy in the early 70s. My mom is Italian, so technically Italian is my is my mother tongue. But uh, uh, since the age of two, I grew up in Mogadishu, and uh, so the, the the everyday life language was Somali. Somali was a language that was uh, had a very strong um, uh, poetry oral tradition, and um, but not in the uh, European sense. I mean the poetry. There were very prestigious po po poets and uh, that would compose their poems and uh, other people that w would memorize them. So the name of the poem, the poets were were well known. And um, so in the 70s, just after the independence, there was this dream. Uh, Somali had this dream of writing officially the language, and the language was written the year be before I was born. And um, so when uh, my father decided, my father basically he he went to Italy um, to study at university, and this is why he met my mother, and I was born, and they were both very young, and uh, um, he was this generation of uh, young men that wanted to go back and uh, work in the country. So um, they th there was a huge project basically because Somalia it's a large I mean uh, area where people would speak the same language but was was divided into different uh, colonies. So uh, writing the language was very important because they, they would have been able to speak to each other, uh, yeah, uh, not with in the colonial languages that were different. And um, so I, I was, at the beginning, he was, uh, they were be living in this project and they studied in Somali. But very soon, unfortunately, because they, they it was too soon, so they weren't able to produce, to, to create the books and the curricula and to have uh, trained teachers for the uh, for the school. So very soon, at when I was eight, nine, I I went to a, an Italian school, and it was very, very f strange in a way because uh, the curricula. I mean, what I was studying was the classical. I mean, um, what s Italian students would study. Uh, but it was very strange because the perspective was completely different. So I, I would say, uh, especially with literature, I mean, um, I studied Dante, I studied all the, the classical, I mean, writers. But the, um, 
the everyday language and also the geography of the place were was completely different. So uh, as, as Amara was saying, language is a shape of also of thinking. I mean, your mind has a sh different shape when you speak in a different language. And my mom, because especially because people, I mean, educated people would speak in Italian. She was, uh, she didn't really never uh, learn Somali properly. So I was her uh, translator, no? So translation was something that I started doing at uh, a very young age. And um, tr traduttore, traditore is very, is very interesting because when you have such a different languages, it's impossible to translate literally the things because you have different imageries. I don't know, for instance, is uh, something that maybe you can relate to, but because the majority of Somali people are um, nomads, they have a lot of words to say to live. So we have a partire, no? So we, we have a lot because it depends when you if you decide to live in the, f in the, in the middle of the day. So, th and they have different significance. Uh, sig uh, yeah, yeah, so meaning, sorry. And um, so, um, I don't know. And I, I always say that I used to have a journal because I loved to write, but also because we didn't have television. So, and I was very introverse when I was uh, young. And, uh, uh, but I was writing things, I, which, which is, uh, it was not pretentious, it was just a hobby. And, uh, but the environment spoke another language. So language for me and translation is this as well, because how you put, in other words, the, I mean, the, a different environment, a different Im imagery, and writing in, in Italian was al already an exercise for me to a translation in a way, yeah. Thank you so much. It's yeah, it's uh, it's impossible not to translate. <laughs> it's impossible for you uh, and for many people, I think. But it's really. Um, I have a follow-up question because uh, Uba, you mentioned the, um, you know, the colonial history and the colonial language. So what, um, what is your relationship with? a language that it's a colonial language that carries violence. And so, you know, the bigger question would be what is the relationship for you between language and power, if that is something that um, you think about and how do you, um, how do you translate it into <laughs> your writing? Okay, then um, I think that uh, for me is, is very interesting. I was talking with Eleanor yesterday about it. Um, for me, it's a very ambiguous, I mean, relationship because it's true that it's a, the colonial language, but I have, it is my mother tongue. So my mom, I mean, my mom is Italian and she was very young when I was born. She was 20. Uh, she, she, she didn't come from a very um, bourgeois um, environment. She was the only one of her family that studied. She was very s poor family. She was the only one who had this opportunity. She didn't know anything about out of Verona. She she had never been out of Verona. She was very, and um, so growing up in Mogadishu, in this very patriarchal society, for me she was the vulnerable one. So for me this this thing of vulnerability how can I say, it's the colonial language, but for me, my mom was the vulnerable one. So this helped me in a way to think about, to change my perspective in a way because, but also to think about responsibility because we always have, uh, your position is a responsibility. We cannot just think that people ha have think in a way, translate in a way because they, they have this position. Everyone has his own story, and it is different. So seeing my mother in that kind of environment where she couldn't speak, and uh, she was this young woman and this white woman in this, in this society, for me, was a very important experience in a way. Even though Italian was, of course, she had a privilege because she was a wh white woman, and uh, she was a teacher, she had a job. It, I don't say that, but. Yeah, there is this but, but, 
Yeah, and I would love to hear also Amara about this power and language because also uh, I thought um, in, in Madri especially in Madre Piccola, um, obviously Somali Italian was never th there was not a pidgin Italian. I mean, Italian was used in the relationship with the, the colonizers. So there are some words. It's very interesting because there are words related to the kitchen and the and the um, la meccanica because this is the th th this was the relationship between Somali and Italian. These words um, um, didn't exist but perhaps in Somali and so they were assumed by Somali. So sometimes in Madre Piccola just to suggest this um, reverse uh, reversion I mean this subversion of power I try to put uh, these um, Italian words that were um, somehow p pronounced with the phonetics of Somali. So, yeah, it's just because often, I mean, the, the, the language that is much powerful um, enters in the other one, yeah, m more often than. Thank you. I, I, in Algeria, there is a, a huge debate about, you know, the, um, the French. As, a, as part of the legacy of colonialism. I have a different idea. So my idea is that, actually it's based on a very famous slogan uh, in Algeria after independence. After independence in 1962, Algerians um, started agriculture revolution. Uh, it didn't succeed, but the slogan was great. The slogan was, uh, the land belongs to who takes care of it. The land takes of the... And I think it's the same thing with language. Language belongs to who takes care of it. This is why it's very important to disconnect language from nationalism and from colonialism. Because the, the, the core of nationalism is language. There is no nationalism without language, with one language. And this is the same thing with, uh, with colonialism. Um, so um, in Algeria, we used to call the ant uh, mother. So I have my biological mother, and I, have, I had two. Two, uh, two mothers, they are my aunts, and they call him my mother. And my cousin called my mother mom. So we have, uh, uh, so this is why I consider Kabil my, or Tamazigh, my mother, mother tongue, my first mother, Arabic, my second mother, French, <laughs> my third mother, Italian, my fourth, English, my fifth, and maybe in the future, Spanish or other language. And for learning languages, you don't need to have a visa or permission. If you want to learn Chinese, you can do it. You are free. Uh, you, are, you, are, you have a complete freedom to learn language. Uh, but if you want to go in China, you have to, <coughs> to ask if there's a uh, you know, uh, visa. Or, uh, there are some, so, some requirements. Uh, this is why. In language, they are really a freedom. This is why I love languages. And, uh, and any language I learned, Italian belongs to me, not to Italians. And the French belongs to me, not to French. Uh, Arabic belongs to me, because even in Algeria, they are uh, friends. They are criticizing me, saying you write in Arabic. The reason, because after Algerian independence, uh, Algeria shows the nationalism uh, so the, the, my mother tongue was, was banned in school. I didn't learn uh, Kabil. So I am very fluent in Kabil, and I still speaking uh, Kabil with my mother and my five sisters and three brothers, but I can't write it. But this is in the future. In future, I would like to learn how to write it. Um, and for a lot of uh, Algerians, um, especially Kabil or um, Berbers, uh, the 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 thing that I have to have, I have I have to uh, to be uh, critical with Arabic. So I have I, why I am writing in in Arabic. 
So the Arabs, you know, banned my language. But my response is very easy. Ar Arab, Arabic belongs to me, not to Arabs. This is my language. Um, I don't have a problem with the, so I'm critical with nationalism and colonialism, even, you know, with French. So uh, in my opinion, French has nothing to do with colonialism. The reason is very simple for me. Language is culture, is poetry, is art, right? Creativity. Colonialism is destruction, is violence. You know, well, there's no relationship between them. And we didn't, we didn't need colonialism to learn French. In Algeria today, there are, uh, I have friends uh, writing in, in, uh, in, in French, and they were born after French colonization. So they, they learned French, and they could learn English or Spanish. Or so, uh, so language is not the legacy of colonialism. Language is not the legacy of nationalism. And this is the best way, by the way, the best way to be, um, to, to fight against nationalism is to use language uh, and to show them that it's not, it's not your private property. It's language. Language is belongs to who take uh, care of it, use it for, for you know, for, uh, for creativity uh, in everyday life. Thank you. I really like how you're turning my questions upside down. <laughs> I really like it. Um, it's very interesting. Instead of uh, you know, language, language and freedom, very interesting. I think, um, and also the question Uba you mentioned about the mother tongue and the you know the correspondence between mother tongue and colonial language. Very you know. Very interesting. Um, I have another question on this, but it's a question about more about your um, the people you write for, you know. And I don't know if you have an answer for this, but um, who is your ideal reader, and do you see um, how do you feel, and where do you see yourself as a writer and as a voice that speaks about something that is common or collective, um, so a collective experience um, with reference to your reader. Does that make sense? It was a little bit of a confusing question. No. It's not a confusing question. It's about audiences. Uh, this is very, you know, the publishers are very obsessed <laughs> with, uh, you know, the audience. I th for me, at least, uh, writing is a, is a way to, to understand. Um, um, uh, uh, maybe the fact that I, um, I try to mix uh, academia and, and creativity. So I did my, um, <laughs> maybe the best example is Divorce Islamic Style, my novel, is based on my dissertation. Uh, about Muslim immigrants in Italy. So instead of publishing a dissertation, actually I got a contract to publish the um, uh, dissertation as uh, an essay with La Terza. La Terza is really uh, interesting. But I was really, I was working on my novels and they said, um, so Divorce Islamic Style is based on my dissertation. Um, so, uh, So by mixing academia, that means research, uh, solid uh, uh, knowledge, with, with creativity. This is my uh, ideal um, you know, uh, project. Uh, and each novel, each, my, each, my no each novel is based on really a lot of research. Um, for the last novel, the, uh, um, um, the Night Bird, in Arabic, mm -hmm. I, I went to Algeria. I lived in, uh, in, in Oran, in very famous because Albert Camus um, wrote La, La Peste, the, the plague. It takes place in, in Oran. Um, so I lived there, and I wrote uh, this, this novel based on uh, many years of research, you know, because it was about 60 years of Algerian history. 
Um, so when I'm writing, basically I'm writing the story for me. I wanted, I'm obsessed with uh, one question. Uh, for instance, um, Clash of Civilizations over an elevator in Piazza Vittorio was based on one uh, uh, obsessive question. Because I was living in Rome and I was uh, hearing people, Italians, saying, oh, Italia, it, Italy is changing. Italy is becoming multicultural. And they said to them, excuse me, so you are multicultural for centuries. I mean, if you put one from Nepal and from Milan, they are completely different. This is a different, uh, and, and the, uh, in the end of the, our conversation, I'm going to read a passage of, uh, of Clash of Civilizations of an elevator in Piazza Vittorio. The character is Antonio Marini, he's a professor from Milan, and he hates Rome. And he hates Roman. They are going to, to now this is a multicultural society. You don't need immigrants. You are a multicultural society. Uh, and there was, I said, I'm going to write a novel about that. Uh, this is a clash of civilizations of an elevator in Piazza Vittorio was based on this question. Another question for divorce Islamic style was that I left Algeria, escaped Algeria in 1999, and, um, and I lived as a refugee in Italy. And I was obsessed with the question of Islam uh, because I witnessed the crisis of Islam. The, the Islam as a religion was used in, uh, in, the, in civil war. Was one, I said to myself, there is a problem. And I, unfortunately, after that, uh, uh, September 11 happened. But we lived in Algeria and other uh, Muslim countries. We lived uh, September 11 before. So, but living in Italy, I, I saw that the, there is a, a possibility to reform Islam, but from outside, from diaspora, because you can't reform Islam in Muslim countries. This is my idea, and probably I'm going to teach this course, the, the course about Islam diaspora at Yale next semester, next year, because I'm very interested in this, in this, in this question. So you can't reform Islam in Arab words for very simple reason, we have two powers. We have two players. We have dictators in one side, and we have fundamentalists on the other side. People believe that they are, think they are ad adversaries, but they are not adversaries. They are playing in the same team. So, and they are against uh, any reform. But living outside, in contact with, with uh, you know, in, in, co in, democ in democratic context, with freedom, living, W watching others, you know, you have contact, you have Jews, you have Catholics, you can have a different idea. So my dissertation was based on this idea, and they transformed this idea on a uh, uh, novel. Uh, now, I, I didn't write for one audience. Uh, I, I write it for me, because I wanted really to, to understand and to know and, uh, and it turned out that this is the, I mean, for, I mean, at least for me, the best way to be um, very convincing with others. Because you write it for you, and now you can share it with others. And of course, translation is another, uh, <laughs> another um, uh, um, um, very interesting uh, um, subject, because you write a novel Divorce, uh, clash of civilizations of an elevator in Piazza Vittorio. I wrote it in Arabic, and then I wrote Italian version. And from Italian, was translated into nine or eight languages, and they made a movie. And this is uh, a lot of audiences. And uh, maybe the law, the, the, uh, the one the the ja Japanese the Japanese wanted to translate the uh, Clash of Civilizations. I was very curious. I said. This is about Rome, and this is about immigrants, and about Italy, multi in, in Italy. So the translate, my Japanese translator said, you know what? We have uh, immigrants in, in Japan, too. We have Koreans. So it's the same, the same preju prejudices, the same uh, uh, problems, the same challenges. And in Germany, there are other immigrants. But this is, this is to say that uh, the basic identity for us is human identity. So if we are Algerians, Americans, French, it's just a coincidence. 
we don't have any credit for that. The same thing with genre, you know, we, we born men, women, and we don't have any credit for that. So this is just coincidence. But the real and the basic identity is human identity. And we have a lot of things to share, a lot of, a lot of share. But we have to cross borders. This is the problem. So if we have this, those borders, we, we can't communicate. We can't cross. We can meet uh, different people uh, and different cultures. And the whole, I think my Christina and I, uh, uh, we have the same uh, goal. So we are crossing borders of languages, of cultures, because it's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy. But it's the, the best way to be original. It's the best way to be original. Audiences, yeah, I was. I had this idea when we were talking about language because, basically, language is. We use language to communicate. We speak to communicate. We use our voice because, we want to be in relationship with other people and uh, to talk to other people, and for me, uh, this is mainly. I I think what um, I think that. Writing is a way also to, to, to get in touch with the place, with other people, and to really to create this relationship. So I was a little bit obsessed at the beginning because uh, after the war, I mean, um, I, I say that I used to write every day, but then for many years I was, uh, I was unable to write, and uh, it took me a lot of time to, to regain this um, this, thi this thing. O also, I was unable to write even a sentence, and anything, uh, because the magnitude, what happened was so big that I, I mean, the people that were surrounding me uh, couldn't, I thought that they couldn't be related to what happened, and uh, I didn't have the the language in the sense that I didn't, it's not that I didn't have the, the words, but uh, I didn't know how to say these things. So it is also about talking about violence, about things. And uh, um, so um, so for me, um, and I lived in Hungary, now I live in Belgium, so I'm still writing in Italian from another place. And um, it's very interesting to look at Italy from outside. Um, so I think that audience is also something that changes you. And I was... I think that also for me, uh, this travel here, and um, we were talking about labels. Uh, at the beginning, we were, we were labeled as uh, migrant writers. And um, so some people were asking, uh, used to ask us, oh, is, is it OK for you to be defined as, now there is this post-colonial <laughs> yeah, uh, label. Yeah, but it's, it's very interesting. So, uh, often, uh, especially living in abroad, um, I find myself with other diasporic African writers that write in different languages. But it's it's very important for me to think that we are not isolated as writers. I mean, our thoughts, things that we we do, and uh, the way that we write. I mean, the, the issues that the topics that are important for us are born also in relationship with this kind of conversation like today. So I love, I love to think, uh, to say this, because it's not that we, we stay in our ivory tower. Come si dice? Torre de... And then we, we know, because it, I mean, it's something that is, yeah. And for me, is Italian is also somehow a I think that is, um, for me, is also a political issue because I think that somehow um, there were not uh, people that were colonized by Italians that the ge my father's generation, for instance, nobody wrote in Italian. There is Nuridin Farah who, who writes, decided to write in English, and th there won't be a generation after my generation that uh, will be born from... Uh, ex-Italian colonies that we rewrite in Italian. Um, so I think that this kind of coincidence that um, there is also hijab and a few ri women writers that have this uh, colonial past. 
So I think that it's uh, also a political responsibility in a way. I don't know how. And also because I had also the, I was lucky enough to grow up there, to grow up there in, in Mordishu and um, so to have also this perspective, yeah. So as I said, as I said in Clash of Civilizations, there are many characters and one of the, those is uh, the Professor Antonio Marini is from, let's see. Stamattina ho aspettato il 60 per mezz'ora al Caponia di Via Giolitti, vicino a Piazza Vittorio. Alla fine sono arrivati tre autobus, uno dietro l'altro. Gli autisti sono scesi senza badare alle proteste delle persone in attesa e sono andati al bar di fronte alla fermata per sedersi a un tavolo all'aperto e bere il caffè, fumare qualche sigaretta e spettegolare. Abbiamo aspettato un'altra mezz'ora alla partenza. Alla fine, gli autisti si sono alzati tutti insieme. Ognuno ha preso il suo posto e sono partiti. E la Madonna? Dove li chi sem? A Mogadiscio o a Addis Ababa? Siamo a Roma o a Bombay? Nel mondo sviluppato o nel terzo mondo? Fra poco ci cacceranno dal club dei ricchi. Queste cose al nord non succedono, eh? Io sono di Milano e non sono abituato a questo caos. A Milano rispettare gli appuntamenti è cosa sacra e nessuno osa dirti ci vediamo tra le 5 e le 6, come capita a Roma molto spesso. In questi casi ho l'abitudine di rispondere con fermezza ci vediamo alle 5 in punto o alle 6 in punto. Altrimenti, che senso ha il detto il tempo è denaro se nessuno ne tiene conto? Quella di lasciare Milano e venire a Roma non è stata una decisione sa saggia. Roma, la città eterna, la bella Roma, Roma amor. No, mi dispiace. Io non guardo Roma con gli occhi del turista che viene per una settimana o due. Fa un giro a Piazza Navona, a Piazza di Spagna... La Fontana di Trevi scatta qualche fotoricordo, mangia la pizza e gli spaghetti poi torna nel suo paese. No, io non vivo nel paradiso dei turisti, ma nell'inferno del caos. Per me non c'è differenza tra Roma e le città del sud, Napoli, Palermo, Bari, Siracusa. Roma è una città del sud e non ha niente a che fare con città come Milano, Torino o Firenze. La gente di Roma è pigra. Questa è l'evidente verità. Vive di rendita sfruttando le rovine, le chiese, i musei, il sole che fa impazzire i turisti del nord Europa. Immaginate Roma senza il Colosseo, la Coppola di San Pietro, la Fontana di Trevi, i musei faticani. La pigrizia è il cibo quotidiano dei romani. Basta ascoltare il dialetto che usano nella loro conversazione. Si mangiano metà delle parole per pigrizia. Io mi arrabbio quando i miei colleghi romani dell'università mi chiamano Antò. Rispondo in nervosito, mi chiamo Antonio. Poi basta vedere i film di Alberto Sordi, come il Conte Max, o il Marchese del Grillo, o un borghese piccolo piccolo, per scoprire il vero volto dei romani. Sono fieri dei loro difetti e non provano imbarazzo nell'esprimere la loro ammirazione per la donna che tradisce il marito o per la persona che non paga le tasse o il forbone delinquente che viaggia in autobus senza il biglietto. Io, io odio la loro arroganza. Vi ricordate la battuta di Alberto Sordi? Si può dire una parola a questa letteratura? Io sono io e voi non siete un cazzo. Questa è la vera natura dei romani. Sorry, because it was so 
funny and beautiful. <laughs> and now this is very dramatic. <laughs> so this is the this is from my first novel, uh, Madre Piccola, Little Mother. Uh, Madre Piccola, by the way, it says yeah, Madre Piccola is uh, um, we say also in Italian, Piccola ma Madre. And um, this is the voice of Ahado. I was talking, I was speaking about relationships. So Ahado basically is, um, uh, Madre Piccola is a novel about the diaspora. So uh, we have three characters and each of them speak to somebody. So Ahado is talking to Bernie, who is um, uh, her cousin. And uh, he, they, they haven't met for many years, they grew up together, and uh, now they, they meet again. And so she's she's the, she's telling her story somehow. So I am reading the first part. Berni mia, quello che sapevi di me, niente è rimasto uguale. Notizie ti devono essere arrivate da qualche parte di questi miei anni, dei miei trascorsi. Anche il discorrere, il mio modo di parlare è cambiato assai. Come dicono, siamo spugne noi mescolati, mescolati viaggiatori. Quante lingue ho dovuto, ho voluto imparare quella per entrare dentro la gente, perché sai, alla fine in tanta parte di mondo vissuto è sempre così. Dentro le nostre case somalo, in tutto e per tutto. Pote potevi anche non vedere il contorno, ignorare la temperatura dell'aria, non ascoltare le altre voci, vivere solo tra di noi imparare lo stretto necessario. Tentavo all'inizio, bolla di sapone trasportata dal vento, di ritrovare a caso i miei percorsi. Se ti dicessi quanto è tutto iniziato, questo aeroporto in questa città e di Vena accanto a me, trauma di guerra, sentieri intrecciati, se ti avessi incontrata prima, ma no, era questo il momento, il principio, follia di smarrimento, storia mia che avevo rimosso di tante separazioni, ti ho lasciata, sorella mia, sono partita e ho cancellato tutto d'un colpo. Nove anni, avevamo nove o dieci anni, quando ci siamo viste l'ultima volta, ricordi? Sapevamo forse che ci saremmo ritrovate oggi, dopo più di vent'anni, ma gli affetti profondi sono di fibra sotterranea, persistente. Vent'anni, ti dicevo, spezzati a metà. La prima metà, una vita qui, dimenticanze. Ho cancellato il somalo rapidamente. Rimuovere, la nostra mente fa, fa, fa questo, chiude dentro gli armadi, vicino a mia madre, lontana da mio padre. Dovevo disambientarmi rapidamente, cancellare un territorio della memoria e costruirne uno nuovo, coordinate che mi mancavano. Ho rattoppato quella, l'assenza di mio padre, toppe che prima o poi dovevano scucirsi. Barlumi di luce, Barney, quando ti sognavo. Sempre lo stesso sogno. Arrivavo, ma non riuscivo mai a vederti. Qualcuna che però non eri tu. Viso che si deforma. Poi anche i sogni mi hanno lasciata. Ho vissuto mimetizzandomi. La seconda metà dei, dei vent'anni trascorsi. Vita di diaspora, peregrinazioni senza destino. Com'è accaduto? Ti dicevo del, del viaggio postumo. Sono arrivata in una città da evacuare, Mogadiscio dei miei natali. È lì ben che mi ha salvata, dal panico, dallo scoramento. Siamo tornati a Roma insieme sull'ultimo volo di linea. Fermarci per poco. Ormai il mio destino era il suo destino. Languivo, un dolore persistente da capogiro. Non mi dava tregua. La notte con gli occhi spalancati. Le ore passavano con quel rodimento, come un piccolo scalpello che scava minuziosamente la carne. Cercavo dentro di me le radici delle esistenze. Vo volevo recuperare, disordinatamente. Disordinata è stata la mia vita. Ora forse un po' di pace. Raccontarti tutti gli abiti indossati. Thank you. Sorry for this. It's, I mean, because I, I choose this, uh, this excerpt because I wanted to, to speak also about trauma. I mean, sometimes what trauma does with language, I mean, forgetting the the language and, uh, yeah, and identity and language, so thank you. We can open the, um, the floor Any to questions? the Q&A. Uh, I have a question for uh, Amara. Um, can you tell us more about the role of Tamazik uh, in your literary plans? So you said that like your 
maybe planning to, to use it in the future. And uh, I was thinking about it, especially when you said that your, when you're writing, your Algerian characters spoke to you, were not able to speak to you in Arabic, in, in Italian. In what language were they speaking to you? Uh, were they speaking to you in Arabic or in Tamazic? And um, I forgot the last part of my question. Um, fine. Oh yeah, uh, I got it. Um, where do you think the use of Tamazic um, would bring you? Like, would it bring you to some new perspectives, some some new characters or topics or spaces? Respond, or yeah. So very quick. Um, so when we deal with uh, with creativity, we don't have certainty. This is the the, the rule. And uh, so you are doing some things that maybe you you know the uh, when you start, but you don't know where you are going. This is an adventure. Um, uh, so this is my project. This is my project, and then um, I have a plan. Uh, you know to learn how to write, and uh, let's see. Maybe I have to write uh, a story taking place in with Kabil, and maybe they are going to talk to me in, in Kabil. Um, so I'm saying this because I, so I, I write, I wrote a Clash of Civilizations in, in, uh, ever, uh, over in Leviathan Piazza Vittorio in Arabic, and when I was writing, I, I, can, I could hear them talking in Italian, and this is why after that I started writing in Italian. Divorce Islamic Style, I wrote the no this novel at the same time, it's like twins, and they were born at the same time. And I, 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 I had to switch the, the, the keyboard from Arabic to Italian. So in the morning, I had to, to ask them, they have two characters, which language do you want? He said Arabic, or because they are, so there's um, an Egyptian uh, woman uh, living in Rome, so she is bilingual. And they have an Italian from Sicily, there's an Italian uh, interpreter who speaks Arabic. So they are bilingual. So every morning I have to, to ask them which language, and then I, I switch from one language to another. Uh, my third novel, Dispute Over, in, in a very Italian piglet. The story takes place in Turin. So this novel I wrote it just in Italian, because the characters, pro they wanted to talk in, uh, in Arabic. And after that, I wrote the, the prank of the little virgin, La Zingarata della Virginella di Ormea, the same takes place in Salva Salvario in, in Turin when I moved from Rome to Turin. Uh, so this novel is just in Italian, not in Arabic. And in 2019, I wrote the, the novel in Arabic and I wrote the Italian, but it w didn't work. It didn't, uh, it didn't work. But in the future, I have a project about New York because I lived nine years, seven years in New York and I have a lot of it. I lived in Harlem, so I have a lot of stories there. So maybe, maybe they are going to talk to me in English. Uh, so, but it's an adventure. Uh, writing is an adventure. Creativity is an adventure. You, and this is, I think, the, the best thing, the most exciting thing that you are, it's an adventure that you are going to s discover something new. And I don't know, maybe in, um, in a few years I will come here saying it uh, didn't work. Um, do you have to e experiment something different? Hi, thank you both so much. My name is Aisha. I'm an anthropology graduate student here uh, at Brown. Um, well, thank you both so much. Um, and I guess, like, I kind of related to your stories on a personal level because my mom is from Egypt, my dad is from Turkey. I was born and raised in Turkey. Now I'm living in the US and I did my dissertation research in Palermo in Sicily. So when people ask me like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, Ugh, like do I need to tell you? Like, do you want the short version <laughs> or the long version? Um, but at the same time, you know, the relationship with the languages, it's very dynamic. I was just talking to Christina, my Italian instructor, actually, <laughs> just earlier, and I was saying, like, you know, just it's been a few months, and I feel like I'm kind of forgetting Italian already. 
And um, when you started first reading Amara in Arabic, for example, I was like, okay, this is modern standard Arabic, which I studied a little bit. But for my mom, I speak the Egyptian colloquial. From my research, like my master's research, I used to speak the Syrian Palestinian colloquial. So it's just, I guess what I'm trying to say is like all these languages kind of fly around and they're not like, you don't speak them 100% all the time, and I guess I wonder your relationship with language in that sense, and of course I'm not a writer, and my language skills are probably like much worse, um, but like I guess I wonder like your relationship with each language, and like how that changes over time, or like depends on like where you are in time and space, if that makes sense. Thank you. So uh, it's, uh, it's very challenging, certainly. It's, it's very challenging. But um, it depends on um, you know, personal experience. Um, this is why it's, uh, it's not a good thing to do, uh, to generalize. Uh, we, we are different. I mean, each one has a, a, a different story and different relationship with, uh, with, uh, with languages. Uh, so I grew up in multilingual context, and I um, and I, I have, uh, I don't have any uh, difficulty to switch from one language to another. For, for they are, you know, very, for me, they are, they are there, I mean, they are there. I can use, I can talk Italian, or I can switch to French, uh, English, Arabic, Tamazi, uh, uh, very easily. This is a training, you know, I trained, uh, I was trained in this, in this way. Um, I think the, the best, I think, the best relationship with language. Uh, I have, uh, I have two, uh, two uh, little girls, and I, I can um, uh, watch them, uh, observe them how they learn language. And the children are, are f fantastic because I'm not judging, and they are, they are having fun uh, sp speaking. And we adults, we have a different approach. We are obsessed with, uh, you know, how people think about us, etc. So I think we have to to go back, to go back to our um, our childhood, and uh, because going back we can learn a very important lesson, uh, and this lesson is uh, is modesty. Be humble. This is my advice for uh, my students, for everyone. If you want to learn language, you have to be humble, because if you are arrogant, you are not going to learn language. You are not going to learn in nothing, anything. So being humble and making mistakes, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a, you are in the good way. And I remember when I, I started learning Italian, I was encouraging my friends to correct me. Uh, and in this way, I learned very quickly uh, Italian, and I, I still making mistakes even in Arabic, Italian, English. But this is the way. <coughs> this is the way to do, to have courage. But uh, be humble, this is the thing, and accept the vulnerability. Because we don't have, um, we can't control language. We can master, this is another uh, bad word, master language. It's not, uh, it's not slave to master language. Language is not slave to master it. So uh, you can, language could be uh, a partner, uh, a friend, uh, but not, uh, you know, uh, slave and master and, uh, We would love to, if you want to weigh in on your relationship with multiple languages, feel free. We want to hear from you. <laughs> no, I wanted Amara to have m more space because I'm staying here for a few <laughs> more days. And yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I love this, this connection that you made about maîtrise in French as well. I mean, uh, not, uh, yes, master the language is, um, and be, being humble um, is, is, is something very important. At, at the end of the day, we, we speak to communicate, as you said, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, um, I don't know. I think that also when you speak 
different languages also the way you 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 write in in a language changes because you absorb somehow the music of other uh, the other languages that you speak so they the influence it's it's a uh, very a huge dif influence on uh, on you even whatever you language you choose you you it's um i mean it somehow it um yeah it is affected by this this other the, the other the musics of other languages one question from the Zoom that I'll put into the room. So this comes from Alessandra Balzani, who asks, she says, thank you so much for this conversation. I would like to know how both authors feel about being called, in quotes, migrant writers or post-colonial writers. I think this is something that uh, you, you may have, have weighed on in on in, in different ways. Um, we're curious to hear now. Is there a label or category they feel they belong to? So I don't have any problem with this definition or category for the, the simple reason. Um, first of all, I believe that migration is a fantastic experience. Um, if you want to, 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 to have more details, I, I'll, uh, I have a TED talk about um, four ways to expand your identity. It's on YouTube and, and TED. This is, and one way to expand your identity is, is, is migration. And there are language, migration, a different, uh, a different definition of diversity, diversity as part of identity. And the fourth way is storytelling. If you want to expand your identity, practice this fourth. So for me, migration is, is, uh, is the most important experience after death. Death is the, I studied philosophy, so <laughs> death is central. Uh, this is the big mystery, and, the, and death gives sense for, for, for life. Without, without death, there is no life. There is no sense of life. Um, so after, my, after death, we have migration, because migration is, is dying and uh, born, and, bo and uh, um, you, you know, you die and you're born. So when you immigrate, you die. Only you can ask uh, all immigrants when they they immigrate, the man or the woman or the, the the person who immigrated is not is not the same anymore. Even if he came, he or she or came back, come back to the you know to the original uh, uh, place uh, or city where he or she born. It's a different place. And migration changes forever. So this is the, uh, the, the fantastic thing. So you die and you're born. So when you're born as immigrant, as a new person, you have a possibility to have an, uh, a different life, a new life. So I was born in Algeria in 1970, the first time. I was born the second time when I immigrated to Italy. And by the way, in my permit, permesso di soggiorno, the res resident permit, I remember there is data di ingresso, date of, uh, this is my birth, you know, data di ingresso. This is, I was born there. And I, I was born for the third time when I moved to New York. Th I have three lives. And maybe in the future we'll have another, another life. So for me, migration is a great experience, it's a very positive experience. For others, especially for the nationalists and um, the post-fascists and all the you know this 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 uh, these people, they believe migration is uh, is uh, is a tragedy, is a negative experience, is a criminality, uh, uh, and I know this this topic about uh, uh, migrant writers, so they apply this negative uh, conception about about us. So this is not my problem if you have a negative idea of migration. By the way, uh, in Italy there is a, a huge issue about migration because Italians, the, you know, uh, the, in, uh, in one century, uh, from 1870 and 1970, in one century, 20 million of Italians left Italy, 20 million. And a lot of them had, had a really a bad, bad uh, and a trouble, bad experiences. So a lot of them are illiterate, 
and the you know they, they went to Canada, they went to Australia, to the States, and the relationship with Italy is very, um, uh, very difficult. You know, very difficult relationship. So uh, this is about immigration of Italians outside. There is another internal immigration, and this is the worst of the worst. It's the migration of Meridionale. The southerners from the south after the Second World War, they moved from the south to the north, to Torino, Turin, and Milan to work. And they, had, they were discriminated, and although were Italians, citizens, Catholics, and white. I don't know if Italians are white, but I can say they are white. So they are the same, but they were discriminated. I told you before that I am obsessed with questions. And one of the questions that I obsessed, it's why Italians with this fantastic experiences of migration? So they went out, they went everywhere. And, and now when people are coming to Italy, they are in crisis. Why? I, so I wrote two novels. I went to Turin, by the way. I moved from Rome to Turin to just to respond to this, to find the answer. So I went. I lived in San Salvario. It's a neighborhood in Turin, uh, close to the the, the Porta Nuova station. It's a central station. Immigrants are very often around the stations. So I lived there for two years, and I wrote two novels. It's about this: the memory, the relationship of Italians. Italians and the memory. And I have to say, Italians didn't accept this no these novels. And I had a lot of negative critiques. And one of them said, the, this uh, Algerian, uh, you know, he came to, to Italy to write about us. I said to myself, this is my contribution. This is my contribution to, uh, to Italian literature and uh, uh, to Italian culture because I love Italy. Italy saved my life. So I escaped Algeria, and I, left, I went to Italy, and I am very thankful for Italy. And the best way to, to pay this debt is to be sincere and try to, to encourage Italians to, to, to look at the, their, their past, because they are, and they are in trouble. They are in trouble, because there are a lot of, uh, there is a nostalgia about fascism. This is a big problem. And they are using migration to, uh, you know, to, um, for the, you know, the political purposes. So I'm not, uh, I'm comfortable with the idea of a migrant writer. I don't have any problem because I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I have a positive idea of migration and I think this is a problem with, uh, with memory and the past. And we have to, you know, to have face it. Ita Italians should face this, this issue because they are watching themselves through the mirror of immigrants. Because some very, you know, very often migrants are, are of course, they are not rich, they are poor, and they remember their lives, their past, and they don't want this. They want, they want, they, they want to cancel, cancel this uh, this past. And we can't cancel the past. The past is uh, the psychologists can teach us the past is the, like shadow. Nobody can, you know, uh, go fr far from the, the shadow. This is our past, and you have to find a way to you know, to, to communicate with the past. Yeah, I think that, uh, um, I agree, I think that we arrived at the same time in the 90s when uh, Italy um, suddenly realized that it was not anymore a country of where people were immigrating from, but where people were arriving. And for me, it was really traumatic to, to arrive in Italy and not being recognized, people would ask me why you speak Italian. And so I think that because she was mentioning in the, in the question also about m to these two la uh, labels, I mean, migrant and uh, post-colonial, I think because, uh, because there, was, there, were, there were not a discussion, there was not a discussion about colonies and the colonial past because was, it was a taboo as well, I mean, because it was connected with uh, fascism and uh, but I mean, uh, I mean, I Italy started to colonize um, um, in in the in in the nineteenth century. So it was before that, and uh, so it is related with it, this history. And because there was not a discussion about this, about citizenship and all these things, that there were no space for I mean, for for migrants because. 
there was not a previous discussion. So the two things are are related um, in a way, I think, and strongly related. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for uh, these wonderful readings and then also this lovely discussion. And um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, at some point, I think maybe I can't remember which one of you said it, that, but that um, you know, uh, uh, to own one's language. Um, and and then I think Amar, you brought up the you know the rela of you know the word slavery, and so it made me think of a moment in Prim one of Primo Levi's books. I think it was in the Drowned and the Saved, where he talks about and, and he's actually discussing a, another book written by uh, Victor Klemper about the degradation of the German language, and. Uh, and that in the camps, and uh, and how it is both the degradation of the language itself, but also a relationship of radical dispossession. But then he has a follow-up story, and this is you know after the war, and he is now a chemist again, and he goes to Germany and has a business meeting. And he speaks German, and the German businessmen look at him in a very strange way because he's speaking Camp German. And, and they are horrified, but he says, well, I'm gonna, that's how I'm going to speak German from now on. I will own that language. It's, it, it's a inc really interesting story about a reversal, but there is, I do think, you know, the possibility of a radical dispossession between the speaker and the language. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. Do you do you want to expand, or should we? Okay. <laughs> no, we can. Any last words, uh, Eleonora? Oh. <laughs> well, I just want. I think we we are. Um, some folks might be a little hungry, and I wanted to thank the people on Zoom for all, for all of your wonderful questions as well. I said in the chat there, we'll, we'll share the ones that we didn't get to with the authors. Um, did you want to say anything else or offer any last thoughts before we wrap up? <laughs> no pressure? No, because it's such a powerful, I mean, um, no, I think that it's a beautiful conclusion. I mean, a beautiful ending, and uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, yeah.